Hello people. Good to see you. Just making sure story time's got all the bits. It's a little bit faffy story time today. Sometimes it sometimes it's just a bit faffy, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I think it's I think we've got everything. Yeah. I reckon. Okay. Uh right. You can go there. Okay, I'm just going to artistically drape a bit of material along the back and then we get started. Nice! Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, put that there. So coffee, that's important. Two pens, yes. You come up here. You stay down there. And you. You go there. And I get a picture of diagram. Diagram of an octopus. Ready to go. Ready. Are you ready? I am totally ready. Could not be more ready. I'm flipping you. That's what I'm doing. I'm moving the screen so the people who've completely switched off come back to us. Come back. It is about to start. It's happening. She's here. She's speaking. All right. Hello. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Theory of Science. It's the show where I tell you everything I learned about a thing this week and do a Lego story time at the end. So today, obviously, because obviously, uh, we're doing octopuses. I, who knew I had two pairs of pink trousers, right? One for the one for the arms and, and one for the, I know. I knew they'd come in useful. So, octopuses. Now, if you ask the internet, what is an octopus? They will say, oh, it's, a, it's a, a cephalopod. And you're like, all right, thanks internet. So what's a cephalopod? And it'll go, oh, it's, it's a mollusk. 
Thanks, internet. What's a mollusk? These are the first questions that we need to ask when you answer. When you hear about octopuses, you hear cephalopod, mollusk, and invertebrate. Let's have a quick peep of what those mean, all right? So, oh, I'd better... Yeah, so you know about evolution, don't you? You know that, like, billions of years ago, there was just a one-celled creature on planet Earth. Everything was just one cell. Tiny, very simple. And then, for some reason, it, it, we got two-celled, like, multi-celled creatures and multi-celled things ended up uh, evolving like growing changing reproducing into fungus and plants and animals so they're the three different categories all right a fungus isn't a plant isn't an animal they're all separate so we're going to follow the animal branch of the evolutionary tree and see where it leads here we go here it is <laughs> this line represents all the animals on planet earth uh, so they separate out, okay, they change and evolve, they, they have babies and they eventually change into ones that have backbones. These branches are called phylum. There's actually 31 of those, all different kinds. Um, but th So I've put this one on, ones with backbones, because obviously that branch eventually gets to humans. But there's another phylum, which is just creatures with a certain kind of nerve. It's quite complicated, but they're all called mollusks. And all the mollusks start changing and evolving until some of them have got at least eight arms. So these are all mollusks, but now they're evolving to be sort of different kinds of creatures. So all the ones with at least eight arms are cephalopods. So all cephalopods are mollusks, yeah? It's an animal with a certain kind of nerve and at least eight arms. It's a cephalopod. And then the cephalopods evolve and change, evolve and change. And eventually they evolve into nautiluses, ammonites, and squids, octopuses, and cuttlefish are all going along that branch. And eventually they obviously evolve into squids and cuttlefish and octopuses all being different creatures. And then I didn't know this, octopuses also evolve into two different kinds of octopus, the serena and the inserena. We we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, but yeah, first of all, one last thing to say is... Um, the ones with backbones are called vertebrae. Yeah, a vertebrae is a creature with a backbone. So all the other animals are invertebrates, creatures that do not have backbones. Well, I mean, we kind of, we only, we always talk about the ones with the backbones, like the fish and the amphibians and the reptiles and the mammals. But the invertebrates are things like the insects, the slugs, the jellyfish. So the octopus is kind of famously the most intelligent of the invertebrates. I mean, from the ones I've mentioned there, it feels like the bar is low, but still octopuses, super intelligent. Right. So let's have a little look at those different, those two different kinds of octopuses, because you've probably seen a picture of an octopus and noticed that it looked different to other octopuses. So now we're going to find out why. So the Serena octopuses, they, they, some of them are umbrella octopuses, so they've got webbed tentacles, you kind of picture that. Um, they've got fins, which look like tiny, cute little ears. They don't have an ink sac, they don't do any inking. Here's them, you've seen all of these before, right? This is a Dumbo octopus. Look at that! So these are fins to help it swim, but um, they, they just look exactly like ears. They live in the cold, they live in very deep water. <clears throat> about a thousand to seven thousand meters down. I'm thinking that's maybe why they don't do inking because no, it's so dark down there anyway. But I don't know actually. Here's another one. Look at this, it's so good. So those are the Serena octopuses, and the in Serena ones, it's uh, just all the other octopuses. You know, like that one, that one. You know what I mean? That's a blue ring octopus. Actually, they are extremely venomous, deadly. Right. That's enough of that. So we've got our two kinds of octopuses sorted. Now, I want to ask you a question, a question that I did not know the answer to. Um, this is a diagram of an octopus. There are many questions we could ask about this octopus. What are these? Are they tentacles or are they arms? My question I want you to answer is, where is the head? Where is this octopus's head? Not a trick question. I'll give you five seconds. I guess there's maybe a like, tiny bit of a clue I would have got this wrong. Oh, there's a bit of a clue on the diagram. The answer is, see, I would have thought that this bit, like octopus is very intelligent, so it's, probably, it's obviously got a massive brain here. No, that's not the head. 
This bit is called the mantle, which is like the body. It's where all the reproductive organs and the, the digestive system, all the body stuff is. Look, here's the gills. <clears throat> the head is just this bit in the middle. Uh, where the eye is and then these are uh, arms actually so cephalopod means I think it means head foot because it's just a head with feet attached which apparently the Greeks thought was amusing um but yeah so right where do we where do we even start these are arms they're very similar to tentacles but tentacles only have suckers on the very end and obviously the octopus have suckers all the way along so they're called arms this, they've got about 200 suckers on each arm and they can take in tiny chemicals with their arms. So that means like they can smell, like when you smell, it's just little particles going up your nose. So they do that with their arms. They feel with their arms, they smell with their arms, they taste with their arms. Um, they've got about the same amount of brain cells as a dog, but obviously in a dog and mammals, the vast majority of our brain cells, our neurons are in our brains. But with the octopus, it's actually two thirds are in their arms and only a third in their head. So they're incredibly good at multitasking, which leads us to our activity. Um, yeah, get a, what's someone else gonna say? Mm, oh, well, no, just that scientists used to think that they basically had nine brains because their arms seemed to be so intelligent, uh, but it's not true actually. They do, they do need their head brain, but, but their arms can do amazing things without the head really even being aware of it. So. The, the classic kind of multitasking task that I found on the internet that we have to try and do is, I don't think it matters which arm or leg you use, as long as you use the arm and the leg on the same side of your body. So use your left arm and your left leg for this, or your right arm and your right leg. Get your leg, your foot, and rotate it in a clockwise direction. So move your foot as if it's like the hand of a clock. Just keep going round like that. And then with the hand on the same side of your body, Draw a six in the air and see what happens to your foot. Does your foot change direction? That's what's supposed to happen. I think maybe if you play instruments, you, you've got better at multitasking than other people and maybe you'll be all right with this. Yeah, so rotate your foot clockwise like this. And draw a six. And it's, it's ha weird things happen. Are you finding that? That is called in humans by manual interference. We don't really know why it happens. It doesn't happen in octopuses because their arms have, have got enough kind of sense to do it, to do individual tasks themselves. Whereas in our bodies, we're okay with doing completely different things. So if you imagine tying your shoelace, like that takes a lot of a lot of work, doesn't it? Your two hands are doing completely different things at the same time. It's very complicated. And clapping is fine, because that's something totally symmetrical. But when we try and do very similar things with different hands or different legs, that's when it causes confusion. I, I feel I'm picturing some sort of little traffic jam like happening in the brain cell. I, it's probably more complicated than that, or scientists would have worked it out. Let's do a quick uh, pen one as well. So get two pens and a piece of paper. Draw two small circles on your piece of paper at the same time. Pen in each hand, two small circles at the same time. Here we go. It's pretty easy actually, it's just like the clapping, it's just, you know, symmetrical. I mean, it's not perfect, but uh, now do the same, but do two big circles. That's pretty rough actually, isn't it? <laughs> now try and do one big circle and one small circle. And see which one is the hardest to do. Uh, I'll do a small blue and a big red. So I have, this is the third time I've done this show. That is not totally shabby, but you've probably found that the last one is harder because yeah, human brain cells in the brain. Octopus is fantastic multitaskers. All right, there are other things that I wanted to tell you about the arm. Oh yeah. So once you've, once you've had a go at all this, have a go at moving your tongue around inside your head. How are you doing that? How does the human tongue move? I don't mean like your brain sends a message to the tongue to move. Physically, how does it actually move? I didn't know this. It turns out the tongue is totally different to the rest of your body. Because the rest of your body is a skeleton uh, with muscles sort of on top of it. Whereas your tongue is what's called a muscular hydrostat. There's obviously no bones in your tongue, but it's incredibly flexible. It's the same with an octopus's arm. These arms can go completely 
all over the place. And it's because there's liquid in your tongue, liquid in the octopus's arms, which sort of compresses, squeezes in different places. And that's what moves it around. Yeah, I know. Same with elephants' uh, trunks, apparently. Oh yeah, and the other fact, which is a bit dark, but it was really interesting, is that um, there's so many like, neurons in the arms, they're so independent that if you get, a, you probably don't want to, but if a person takes a dead octopus and cuts the arm off, then the arm will keep moving for up to an hour afterwards. And not only that, the arm of the dead octopus will try and reach for food and put it into a mouth that isn't there. How amazing is that? Because they've got all these brain cells. Uh, right, next thing. Oh yeah, let's have a look at why their blood is blue. So, depending on what kind of body you've got, if you look at your arm, you might notice a sort of blue vein. I'll show you, it's the grossest thing I've showed you on the science, but mine is very clearly, there's definitely blue there, isn't it? Look, I mean, that's how could that not be blue? That is not blue. There's no blue there. That's just, well, the, my blood is not blue. It's just an optical illusion. So weird, because it really looks blue. Human blood is red. A lot of people think that human blood is blue until it gets to the lungs and then it gets oxygen and then it goes red. Uh, no, human blood is always red. It gets more red when it's got oxygen in it. What it is, is our blood uses iron. So there's iron in your blood traveling around your body and oxygen attaches to the iron, right? Uh, so obviously oxygen plus iron does equal redness, you know, like rust is just oxygen and iron reacting together. So that's what carries blood around our body. It's the iron. It's why we've got to eat iron rich diet, you know. So with humans, what's happening here, if you see any blue veins, is that all white light, so all the colours of the rainbow mixed together, are shining into my arm, but blue light doesn't get as far in. Red light and those other colours of the rainbow can sort of travel further into my arm, but the blue light is being scattered, bounced back towards our eyes. So it really looks blue. Totally not blue, just an optical illusion. Octopus's blood is actually blue because they don't use iron to carry oxygen around their body. Uh, they use copper. Yeah, same with some tarantulas, apparently slugs, someone was telling me in the comments on Facebook the other day, and uh, oh, the crabs as well, horseshoe crabs. They actually use copper that bonds to the oxygen and moves it around their bodies. And when copper and oxygen get together, you do get blue. You know, like you see in the churches, the beautiful blue churches in, I don't know, like the roofs. You know, they're metal, but they're bluey green. That's copper. Um, so that's why they've got three hearts. It's what I'm trying to tell you. They've got three hearts because the copper system is not as efficient. It's not as good at getting blood around the body as the iron system, which we got. So they need three hearts to pump the blood around their bodies. Whew, we got there. Yeah, they've got gills, like a lot of other stuff that lives in the sea. So um, oxygen sort of reaches the gills and then is pumped from the gills to other bits of the body. So they've got two hearts uh, kind of just working on the gills and then the other heart works on the rest of the body. Right, is that it? Is it story time? Oh, oh very quickly I want to talk about ink as well. <laughs> yeah, All right, let's finish on ink and then do story time. So octopuses ink uh, as a distraction, essentially, so they can get away from predators. That's why they ink when they're stressed. Um, their ink is made out of uh, some mucus mixed with melanin. So melanin is the pigment that humans have in their skin. The more melanin you have, the darker your skin is. So I've got quite a lot of freckles. That's where uh, my melanin cells are making not too much melanin, because freckles are great, but are like a lot of melanin. Whereas moles, it turns out, are where there's a lot of cells that make melanin close together. Oh, there you go. Uh, yeah, so that's why, oxy why octopus ink is black, because they've got melanin, same stuff that we got. They keep it in an ink sac, which is attached to the rectum, and then when they're scared, the ink comes from the rectum out of the anus, like the same way that they do their poos. Um, I did find a reference to, it's not funny, it's science, a reference to uh, anal flaps. There are some suggestions, I don't know if this is true, but I want it to be, that, that some octopuses like, move their anal flaps to direct the ink. I, I really want it to be true, that they like poo out ink and then use their anal flaps to like create maybe some sort of like, some an image of like a certain animal to scare the animal away that's bothering them. But that's, it's kind of, yeah. It's, you should probably like not pass on that fact until you've done a little bit more research yourself. Okay, story time. 
<laughs> Let's do this. Today's story time is about uh, octopuses most wanted. Octopuses in captivity. Here we go. Ugh, I'm gonna move this phone stand down. <clears throat> 2009. Sid the octopus lived in the Portobello Aquarium in New Zealand until one day he didn't. What? Imagine being the member of staff getting to the tank and being like, uh, oh dear, where did he go? So staff obviously searched everywhere, as he would, very worried. Uh, day one went, went by, no Sid, where was he? Uh, day two, still no Sid. Have you seen him? No, oh, this is a disaster. Uh, five days of hunting, and finally, a member of staff just happened to glance towards the door one day and see Sid making a run for it, trying to get through the door. Oh, hooray! So they grabbed him, put him back in his tank, uh, but it turns out when an octopus has escaped once, they, they generally try and keep escaping. So what had happened, they reckon, is that there was a pipe running underneath the aquarium that brought uh, seawater in, into the tanks, and Sid had probably been living in that. So they put him back in his tank, but like I say, he kept escaping. Eventually, they were putting string on the doors to try and keep him contained, because they were like, well, I probably haven't worked out how to untie knots yet. Uh, but he, he just escaped again and again, and eventually, well done, Aquarium, as far as I'm concerned, they did the right thing. They thought, you know what, it's probably mating season, actually, for Sid, and we should probably set him free. So that's what they did. They scooped him up in a bucket, uh, the day before Valentine's Day, possibly a bit of a marketing ploy there, and released him into the sea. Hooray, be free, Sid. Uh, it's not the end of our octopuses escaping stories. No way. Blotchy and Inky lived in a tank at the National Aquarium of New Zealand. Inky had been brought in by a fisherman who'd found him rather scarred and rough looking in a crayfish pot, apparently. <clears throat> Um, so they both lived in this tank together, reasonably happy, or so people thought. One morning in 2016, staff arrived to find the lid of the tank had been left slightly ajar and Inky was nowhere to be seen. What? Um, Blotchy was still there, apparently. Uh, Inky was the one with the personality, was the quote from the uh, aquarium staff. So what had happened? Well, Inky probably climbed out of the tank but we we don't know he was never found we only have theories we reckon he probably got out of the tank and then crawled about four meters across the floor found the entrance to a drain pipe that led to the sea and traveled 50 meters along this drain pipe till finally he found freedom Yay, be free inky be free <laughs> um, this was obviously very sad for the people who own the aquarium, but it wasn't particularly surprising. Octopuses are known to be extremely intelligent animals. I'm sure you know that yourself. Uh, one octopus, also in New Zealand, was found to be uh, creeping out of its tank at night and stealing crabs, just like munching on crabs in the other exhibition tanks, and then scuttling back to his tank the next morning before staff knew what was going on. Um, the next one's quite sad, really. One octopus in Germany got so bored that he climbed right up to the top of his tank on a night and would shoot water at the light because he'd worked out that if he shot water at the light, then it went off. And that was his entertainment. It took the staff about three days to work out why every time they arrived at work, all the electrical systems in the entire building had gone off. So... Suffice to say, all this means octopuses are very difficult and very expensive to keep in captivity. Uh, one species that doesn't do at all well is the mimic octopus, discovered in 1998. It can change colour like other octopuses, but it can also, very unusually, move its body into different shapes to impersonate different animals. So damselfish can be very aggressive towards octopuses. So what happens if an octopus is getting pestered by a damselfish? is it crawls into a hole and it just sticks two of its arms out and moves them backwards and forwards to look just like a sea snake. Can you imagine how similar that would be? Why does it do that? Well, it's because sea snakes eat uh, damselfish, so it scares them away. 
pretty good, eh? And it can do loads of impressions, apparently, the mimic octopus. It can do jellyfish, crabs, lionfish, uh, quite often, apparently, as it's crawling along the sea floor. Um, mimics don't do well in captivity, so the, the numbers are a little bit worrying. Uh, only one was exported to the USA in 2008. It was two in 2009, but by 2011 it was 30. I couldn't find any more uh, dates. The other octopus, which is the numbers are rising for the ones in captivity, is the blue ring octopus, which is very dead worrying because they are deadly. One golf ball size octopus has enough venom in it to kill 10 humans, but they're very pretty. So pet shop owners have been known to stock them without even knowing what they are. Perhaps Hank, the octopus from Finding Dory, who is not shown here because Disney wouldn't let me, this is Hankish, was right for thinking the touch pools are a bad idea. Oh no, the bacteria on the people's skin affecting me. Oh, I'm too sensitive for this. Um, I'd look around. Apparently the CMI Centre does let you touch stuff. I can only find the Macduff Aquarium in Aberdeenshire showing off about their touch pool. Uh, the people who gave them the money for their new touch pool said... The previous touch pool had become dated and not fit for purpose. They also did not meet best practice for animal welfare. So that's that's great, isn't it, that that's not happening anymore? Um, and finally, to end on a positive note, a little shout out for uh, the Blue Planet Aquarium near Liverpool, which said on their website, conservation is our priority. So we no longer offer a touch tool experience. Uh, suffice to say, if you ever see an octopus in captivity or otherwise, make the most of it. For a variety of reasons, it probably won't be there for long. The end. <laughs> right, oh wait, for legal reasons, I need to show you this. Because <laughs> there were some beautiful pictures in there that I did not own. There you go. I don't know if I should be saying these words out in a, in a very fast, like, advert-style voice, but I, I don't think I could do that. Anyway, there you go. If you want to get those pictures, you can see them online. Um, yeah, no, the only other fact, actually, is that um, octopuses only live for about two years, and it's because they die after they've reproduced. So the males die straight away, and the female octopus, once the, the babies are kind of out and, you know, fine, uh, she dies as well. So, yeah. Very, very sad that they've, for such an intelligent animal, I, I don't know, it seems quite unusual that they they live very short lives. Uh, right, you lot, that is the end of the Octopus Show. Thank you so much for coming. If you would like to support me, you know what to do. Maybe you don't, so I'll tell you. If you go to the About section of this YouTube channel, go to About, click a link called Coffee, it will take you to my website where you can, if you wish, pay me five or six pounds a month and I send you nice stuff. And they're good things because this is the best job ever and I'm very grateful. So if you sign up today, you can cancel at any time. I'll send you some rainbow glasses that make you see rainbows. They're so good. I'm just going to keep these rainbows to myself. You have to order the glasses. Um, and I'll send you Theatre of Science magazine. Ta -da! So this is the latest one. I write it and my graphic designer husband graphically designs it. I'm so proud of it. It takes ages. But that's because I want it to be really good. So it's got a beautiful comic in it about the only British woman to have a Nobel Prize in science. About the discovery of penicillin, because this is on mould, this issue. I send you a free biodegradable plastic bag so you can make a little box, which is on the back. Fill it with uh, food and then watch it go mouldy. Like, bizarrely addictive. I just keep doing it and then you can compost the whole thing. There's a choose your own adventure about you're a mould expert in a museum. Will you make the right decisions or will you be fired? So yes, thank you to everyone who is receiving Theatre Science magazine. Uh, if, I think if you send me another quid I will send you some badges as well. Badges are fun. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much to everyone who's supporting me. Uh, I just love that anyone can come to these lessons totally for free. If you like, if you're home editing, which if you're watching this live then you almost certainly are, then you can also go to my Facebook page at 11, where we are learning about the moon and doing a very cool activity, actually. Right, I'm gonna get on that note, I'm gonna go to my Facebook page and see if anyone has left me any messages. <sighs> then I'm gonna go and set up for my moon show, which yesterday was an absolute disaster. Probably some of you came. Here we go. <laughs> They're not always that much of a disaster, but it really was probably the most disastrous show we've had. Four comment. Oh no, wait, that's a different post. Just, just be. You can go if you haven't left me a comment. Left me a comment on Facebook. I implore you to leave because this bit will probably be very tedious, <laughs> as you may have already noticed. I don't know. 
that, that other science live program with Maddie Mo, they've got like just a computer and it's like, oh, hi, look, Jackie's saying hello. No, I don't have that. Where is even the, where is even the Facebook post? <laughs> where is it? It's not here. Ugh. I'm so sorry. I'm working on it. It's coming. I should just say hello to Shuki and Arzu and Eunice, shouldn't I? And possibly Hannah and Abby. Here we go. Yay, comments. Oh, it's Izzy B. Hello. Oh, no. Are you actually here? Maybe you're just commenting on my photo. <laughs> yeah, I do own a lot of hats. It's true. Um, ba -ba -bam. Oh, Laura Lee couldn't find me again. Did you? Oh, good. You found me. Hello, Laura. Good. Do, 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 do. Okay. I am going to go then. And, oh, yeah. Hello, Shuki and Arzu and Eunice. Hi, oh, yeah. Oh, hello, Flynn. And by Flynn. And Patricia, it is today. I hope you found me on YouTube. It's sometimes a bit tricky to find people on YouTube. Okay, right. I'm going to go and write a moon quiz and set up some flour and some cocoa powder. I will see you on Facebook at 11 o'clock if you want to come to that. Otherwise, see you next week for when we're learning about secret codes. I'm going to write things with lemon juice and then reveal the secret codes and talk about like uh, code breaking and World War II and all that. Very excited about this one. Okay. And there we go.